traditional instrumentation like the, the strings and the, the brass on that record are really raw and unadorned. You know, they're very, very close sounding. They're right there. You know, and that, I think those sounds have really helped define that album. It's, it's, it, it's painful almost, you know. And the string, that particularly on Stuck On You, there's something very, very intimate about that, that song. Whether it's right or whether it's true I'm stuck here and I'm stuck on you This theory about that and there's nearly your nanosecond between the body dying and your brain dying so that's the eternity everyone's talking about imagine what's going through her head at the moment well it's the sort of bullet what was your name again taste of olive oil. There's nothing like new Red Rock Deli chips cooked in 100% olive oil. It's springtime and a man's thoughts turn to hardware. Makita 14.4 volt drill with a bonus torch, $189. Talon 25cc line trimmer, 99 bucks. Mighty helpful, mighty tin. Metallica. I think we kind of sort of gradually started to unearth where the band's strengths lay just through playing live. Big picture, hardest working band in show business, or one of. The sheer power in their live performance that created a following for them. Great, um, great live act, and and people like to drink and sing along, and they're eminently hummable tunes, and uh, and they had choruses, and and Mark was such an energetic um, front man. First time I heard Mark saying, um, "You don't make me feel like a woman anymore," it just went, "Wow, what's this? Did he say that?" I was at my manager's office and I overheard a conversation between these two people through a wall. And the, the girl said to him, you don't make me feel like I'm a woman anymore. That's it. Uh, you told him the story through I a wall. I heard it through the wall. I told him the story. Yeah. And then he had the genius idea to turn it into a song. Hang on, just to clarify. Yeah, that's my version. When he heard it through the wall, Mark wasn't on the other side of the wall. And then Michael re recreated the conversation to remind him. I of swear. What Really? Yeah. Yeah, I know, I know when it happened, too. So. You believe me? No, I can't. I can't. Oh, yeah, but we're not done. <laughs> can't can I? I can't remember. Mark might, but I'm not going to. <laughs> no, it was someone that we knew. Can't name, can't name, can't name. But yeah. you believe me. Things don't make me feel like I'm a woman anymore. 
But what else did Mark hear that day? This one fragile moment of mine, you know, and I'm sure so many people relate to that moment. But yeah, it became a ballad for all those men. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> I just remember coming home from being away, but touring and going around to see her and I, I think she, she felt that I was just taking her for granted and I remember physically her having my finger put, she was sitting on top of me and she's putting the finger in here and telling me that, you know, you just, everything but the line, you don't make me feel like I'm a woman anymore and I thought, I wanted to write, this, describe that feeling and then I heard this conversation and thought, bingo, you know. <laughs> Those were the days that you could, you could go out <clears throat> four or five nights a week and there'd be bands in every pub. And sort of suddenly you're in this thousand people fire trap, um, wooden floors, smoke, beer, half naked people everywhere. Um, it, it was a really, it, you know, an exhilarating kind of adrenaline charge thing, you know. I remember thinking, Everything was out of context for Hunters and Collectors. I mean, we, we made these records that were, I think, you know, that we got up in pubs in front of really suburban audiences that we were really trying to reach and singing these songs about being vulnerable and emotional and fragile and, you know, we're playing stridently and powerfully and it was a very masculine band, but, but the songs were about this other stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there would have been a point at which they started to think, we want to kind of distance ourselves from this kind of lowest common denominator, you know, let's, let's shotgun another can kind of thing, because, yeah, the music did really suit that. It was kind of guys with shirts off in the front row bouncing around, getting really sweaty, and then going to the bar and drinking another beer. But it also, I think, yeah, I think lyrically it, it operated on a, on a more subtle level than that. That sort of emerged out of that kind of two chord groove uh, and we were actually trying to knuckle together this sort of mid-tempo soul groove you know you know typically hunters and collectors way you know that had that pushed kick drum and boom boom You know, it's it's a guy who's completely in thrall of this beautiful woman, and he's she's got control of him. You know, I mean, she had control of me. It sort of reminds me of Otis Redding in a funny way as well. Um, you know, that sort of confessional spirit. You know, where the guy's just sort of, she's, you know, she's, you know, just trying to let all this stuff out. I mean, it's, it's allegorical, of course, but in the video, we actually, um, we gave the Metropolitan Fire Brigade a slab of beer to set fire to a building for us, and they did. And uh, we cut it together to look like uh, that was Mark's work. And uh, it got banned. And if I don't jump up before midnight, and I can't find the key for I mean, it was more the other instruments providing emotional counterpoint to what Mark was doing. So you have the bass and drums doing all this, then the horns providing this other emotional side or, or expressive side to the song that Mark was pursuing. Well, the French horn is so plaintive and emotive that, uh, yeah, it's never going to sound that rock, but it's a good contrast. <laughs> Bye.
Well, because we played in orchestras, we never went near saxophones. Um, and I guess, I mean, I grew up not listening to soul kind of horn sections, with a lot of, which a lot of horn players do. You know, they're, they're kind of steeped in, you know, Motown and, and Stax and just, and jazz, I suppose, more as well. Whereas because we were steeped more in Mahler and Shostakovich, you know, at the time, <laughs> which had lots of French horns and lots of trombones and lots of big brass and strings, of course, which feature on human frailty. Um, that was more the angle we were coming from. something that um, you know that was really profoundly important to me and, and you know I'd come home and turn the television on and just look at it and go what's this about I'm not interested in it In a way, I was sort of saying, well, stuff that's coming to me from the outside world while I was immersed in this relationship was, was, was kind of just bewildering and untruthful. Is there anybody in there? Is there anybody in there? Is there anybody in there? Just the guitarist. Up, up, and, and the bass together which is bum, ba, ba, da, da, bum, ba. They intersect a few times as you play through each bar. So it's a counter rhythm, a counter melody, all at the same time. It's a very simple one, but it's, I think that gives it a bit of feel, a bit of catchiness. Is there anybody in there, the, the way the horns come in almost in, in lieu of a chorus the song just completely changes gear and goes in this whole other direction that's really driving it's a great driving song So the idea was it was a bit of a V8 version of a band. That pin you to the back wall, take no prisoners, sort of really big big snare, big bass, big kick, and then everything else just gets bigger from there. So, which is a fairly simple idea, but we were good at it. <laughs> but it well, and it was contrasted with an emotive vocal with a social conscience and some, all of that was fairly rare stuff at the time. It was also set in an Australian environment. Human Frothy was made on a shoestring um, to the point where we couldn't afford a decent studio. And we, had, we went to Alan Eaton's, which is a little studio in St Kilda, it was uh, used largely as an advertising for, for producing jingles and stuff like that. We used to have to strike the gear on the weekends so that young talent type could come in because the, they were all kids at school and they'd come in and record all their cover versions on the weekends and then we'd put all our gear back afterwards. I think we recorded it in, a, in three or four weeks because we only had the five, four days. I think it was four weeks, mixing another two weeks. Quick. There was a real sense of like we were just alone out in the uh, out on the spiral arm, this little group of blokes who were kind of doing this stuff, and we didn't really feel connected with the broader industry. And you know what we were trying to achieve wasn't necessarily what we got. And um, especially in the context of that conversation that I had with the guys at the Standard Hotel, you know, a few weeks before, you know, we've got to make a commercial record. 
um, we didn't make one, you know. <laughs> Monday, September 29 on SBS. Jason, you brush your teeth? No matter how well your kids brush, there'll always be germs that are left behind. Listerine Smart Rinse helps clean your kids' whole mouth and contains fluoride to protect against cavities. Unleash the Smart Rinse tornado on germs. At Safeway Liquor, right now you can save 20% off all your favourite wines. That's 20% off all wines when you buy six or more bottles. Hurry in to Safeway Liquor today. I think the thing that I learned in that record is that I realised, well, everything that's happening to me, anything that's affecting the way I feel is what I, have, what I write about, from that album on, pretty much. Whereas prior to it, I was, you know, I was sort of in denial in a way. I thought you had to kind of separate, that the, the, the artistic process had to be kind of something that was removed and located outside yourself. You know, that was kind of like part of my academic upbringing and I suppose all the other guys kind of, it was art house. You know, whereas human frailty was really kind of like about, an, like was a point of arrival and a point of departure, because it just it, it affected the, everything that the band did after that as well. You know, I, I listened to Human Frailty and then I then I, I don't know listened to the Arcade Fire or something, and I can hear similarities in the sort of that almost yelpy, desperate voice of you know a guy singing about his sort of you know disaffection and, and confusion the album itself had got incredible reviews and it really took them back to where they were at the start and the band were just unstoppable live um, they they just grew and grew oh, the quieter bits of this morning is definitely the band trying to play to the vocalist and just fit in around what he's doing and what he was doing might have been going moving around quite a bit he's gonna go this morning no sun will shine today and it's jack did the most amazing string arrangements on human frailty if you listen to this morning i mean it's bloody george martin eat your heart out um and he did that all off his own bat brought in the dots organised the, the um, quartet, conducted them. The blind fate's trying to tell me it isn't over. Tell me it's soon not up to be. It kind of worked out very nicely and there was a lot of space in that song, so there was a lot of room to actually fit the strings in, you know, between Mark's vocals. There's quite, you know, like four bars between vocals. So there was lots of room to actually arrange things. Not a lot happening on a bass, so there, there, were, there was room to, to paint. There's something incredibly lonely about it and, and sparse. There's hardly anything in it. You know, it's, the instrumentation is really um, quite physical and sparse. Yeah, there was a lot of arrangement by turning things off. 
Yeah, yeah. This is a great song. It's a big song live as well. You can kind of see the relationships sort of on the rocks here, and yeah, by the end there's sort of almost a... Yeah, that last song this morning sort of seems like kind of full of regret, and but also there's a sort of... Um, yeah, a finality about it, I suppose, you know, that an acceptance, I guess, you know, whereas throughout the album there is that, to me, always that sort of tension that, like I was sort of saying, that feeling of misunderstanding and just not connecting with somebody. The season was turning and it, we were heading into winter and, um, I was, you know, the relationship was was rocky and, you know, we, we just, neither of us felt secure and, you know, it was just stuff coming up between us and I just remember that, you know, that, that the, the wind and the rain on that glass, the rattling of the window in that room just, just had all this foreboding to it, you know. I just kind of saw that as being an, a foreboding sound, you know. And I didn't see how I could emotionally do the two things together. I couldn't be married, the relationship and, and the band. I just wasn't mature enough or didn't have enough wisdom or whatever, you know, I was a really young man and, uh, um, you know, we broke up. So in a way I lost a lot. But blind fate's trying to tell me it isn't over. 